Thank you. Thank you, Director General. Now we'll continue with our opening sessions that actually is seen as a setting the scene session. And our first speaker is Mr. Ku Dongyu, Director General of Food and Culture Organization of the United Nation. Dr. Ku took the office on 2019 as Director General of FAO, fully engaging with how to eradicate hunger worldwide. Before coming to FAO, Ku served as a China Vice Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, where one of his achievements was to promote inclusive and innovative development. Recognized for a scientific innovation as a young scholar, who has for 30 years been involved in international exchange and orchestrated major events, including international conference on plant protection and participated in multilateral initiatives such as the World Trade Organization and the G20, as well as numerous bilateral initiatives. He's also directly helped design flagship South-South cooperation project with FAO and the World Bank. Mr. Ku, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, moderate here my colleague Antonia, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Iran. Thank you for the recognizing the importance of the food security and the climate change to the land, especially those immigrants uh, from the climate change, and both are closely related to FAO's mandate to fight hunger, improve the food security, and the rural poverty, promote the sustainable management of natural resources. Despite the hopes that the world would emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic and the food security would begin to improve, number of people affected by the hunger rose to as many as 828 million in 2021, and an increase about 190, 150 million since the outbreak of the pandemic. Around 2.3 million people in the world were the moderately or severely food insecure in 2021, meaning they did not have access to adequate food. Close to 1 billion people are at risk of farming in the vulnerable countries. Well, at the same time, 3.1 billion people cannot afford a health debt, food insecurity, migration and displacement are the closely interconnected. 80% of the world displaced people are in the countries or territories affected by the acute food insecurity and the malnutrition. And that face the climate risk and other disasters. The impact of the climate crisis continue to negatively impact the food security through the extreme weather event and slow onset changes. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment points out that increased weather and climate extremes have already exposed millions of people to acute food insecurity and reduced water security. Climate exposed sectors such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, aquaculture, and others are those most affected. For example, five consecutive failed rainy seasons have led to the most severe drought in the recent history of the south and east part of the Ethiopia, affecting the fragile livelihood of uh, one about 10 million people who are already food insecure. Slow onset changes in climate and weather patterns are also affecting agroforestry, agro environment, and the people's livelihood. Productivity has been declining in many countries due to the change in temperature, severe weather, and the drought. Rural people are most vulnerable as their livelihood depends on local productivity by local natural resources. Irregular rainforests affect the rain fed agriculture on the more than 80% of the cultivated lands in the world, even in Europe during this year. Climate change is also affecting the pastoralist and the fishery communities, 
rural people have few opportunity and resources to adapt and change climate. And the repeated exposure to the climate events increases the risk of poverty if without a resilience building and investment. This is the placing a lot of pressure to migrate to the forcible displaced or trapped in the high risk area, unable to move. FO is working with the rural populations to address the advice uh, drivers of uh, immigration migration, and to ensure that the migration is a choice instead of a necessity. This includes the migra mitigating the negative impacts of the climate crisis on the rural livelihood, create alternatives to uh, uh, migration and strengthening anticipatory actions to av avert the risk of the displacement. Recognize that the risk rural areas bear the greatest burden in the hosting larger numbers of the displaced people on one third of the effort emergency and the resilient funding is allocated to address the challenges of the forced displacement. Since I cut three years ago as a FLDG. F if it helps rural communities to better manage climate-related risks by promoting climate adaptation practices, the sustainable use and the management of natural resources, and the restoration of degraded ecosystems. In El Salvador, for example, where the changes in weather and the climate conditions are affecting agricultural production and pushing farmers to migrate, FO is working with the government to protect water resources for 1 million people and enhance the climate resilience of 50,000 smallholder farmers. Dear colleagues, it is important to also to see the migration as a potential positive force for the green transition and for the development of the green agricultural systems. The investment in migrants and the dis diaspora and the transfer of skills and knowledges in the climate resilient livelihood and climate smart technologies can contribute to the promoting green agribusiness and improved access to the food. New pathways for the resilience should also look at the creating enabling conditions to harness the potential of a migration for climate change adaptation in the area for origin, transit, and destination. In this regard, FO has developed, together with the United Nations universities, a global guide and the toolkit to facilitate the integration of the human mobility into the national adaptation plans and the national, nationally determined contributions from the rural livelihood perspective. Evidence suggests that if government repurpose the resources they are using to incentivize the production, supply, and the consumption of the nutritious food. This will lead to uh, making health diet more affordable and uh, equitable for all. Governments need to agently re-examine their agricultural trade and market interventions, such as subsidiary, and to ensure that the international trade continue to operate smoothly. Investing in the agri-food systems transformation and the long-term responses are is the key to strengthen the resilience of agri-food systems to risk, including conflict, extreme weather events, economic shocks. Addressing the infrastructure and the input supply bottlenecks is critical to an efficient food supply system. In fact, when the sustainable food supply supply in fact, we have the sustainable support to the smallholder farmers will be vital to ensure they are part of the solution and to localize the supply chain. This calls for multi-sector approaches and enhance the collaboration between policy actors at all levels. FAO, with its unique technical expertise, makes an important contribution to bridge migration and culture and climate stakeholders, acting as a neutral platform and leveraging its wider presence on the ground for the concrete results. Dear colleagues, 
We need to concerted efforts to achieve the more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agri-food system to achieve our collective goals of the four patterns at the country level, at the region level, at the global level. That is uh, better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life for all, leaving no one behind. These objectives are set out in the FN strategy framework 2022-31, and we stand ready and firmly to work with the partners by hand-in-hand -hand initiatives. Together, together, we can achieve this goal in support of the 2030 agenda and the sustainable one goals. As thank you very much. Thank you, Director General. Now, now, our next speaker at the opening session is actually will give us a video intervention online, and this is the Director General of World Health Organization, Mr. Tedros Adhanom Gabriesus. Dear colleagues and friends, climate change threatens health on multiple levels. Displaced people are hit especially hard. Climate change affects the fundamental factors on which all health depends, like air, water, and food. It kills directly through heat waves, floods, and droughts. And it can damage critical infrastructure, leaving millions without health services. The catastrophic floods in Pakistan are a painful example of this. Warmer and wetter conditions make it easier for diseases, including malaria, dengue, cholera, and diarrheal diseases to spread. Climate change threatens food security and nutrition. The millions facing famine in the greater horn of Africa are a testament to this. The disruptive effects of climate change have forced millions to migrate. This exacerbates pre-existing health inequalities. We must act to protect the physical and mental health and well-being of refugees and migrants. First, through building climate resilient and migrant sensitive health systems. Second, by including human mobility and health in national climate change action plans. And third, by taking a migration and health in all policies approach, including food security. We need radical action to safeguard the health of the planet on which all life depends. I thank you. Thank you, Director General. Now we have another uh, participant who is online with us. This is Mr. Janez Lenercic. He's European Commissioner for Crisis Management since 2019. Prior of, to that, Mr. Janez was the permanent representative of Republic of Slovenia to the EU in Brussels, State Secretary for European and Foreign Affairs in the Office of the Prime Minister in Ljubljana. Mr. Janez has also been the Director of the OSC, Office of Democratic Institution and Human Rights in Warsaw, State Secretary is the Head of the Government for the European Affairs in Ljubljana, and Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Slovenia and OSC in Vienna. Mr. Lenercic, floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the International Organization for Migration for bringing us together today. Director General Vittorino, I would also like to thank you personally your opening remarks underscore the acute challenges facing some of the most vulnerable people in the world. More individuals are displaced from their homes now than at any other time in history. And we are seeing a complex interplay of crises and threats driving people away in search for safety and protection. Conflicts, food insecurity, water scarcity, climate change, disasters, and the list goes on. Last week, I was in Ukraine, where the appalling suffering caused by the war will soon be overlaid by an additional enemy, 
winter. There are over 6 million IDPs in Ukraine. There are more than 7 million refugees from Ukraine who have been registered in Europe. At this critical time, our priority focus in Ukraine is to strengthen winterization. But in addition to conflicts, climate change is increasingly becoming a key driver of displacement. Earlier this month, I visited the flood-affected communities in Pakistan. With one-third of the country underwater, almost 8 million people were forced to live in displacement settings. Meanwhile, Nigeria was also hit by its worst flooding in a decade, which killed more than 500 people and displaced close to 1 million. We're also seeing the impact of slow onset events, such as droughts, which erode the livelihoods of communities until there is no other option but to, to leave. This is what is happening in Somalia, where after four consecutive failed rain season, famine looms yet again. And similar situations are unfolding in the Sahel, in Yemen, and in other countries around the world. So what is the European Union doing to help address this crisis and the displacement that they are, they are causing? At home, we are providing protection to the most vulnerable refugees by offering legal pathways to Europe. Since 2015, EU resettlement programs have helped more than 100,000 refugees find shelter in the European Union. They are now able to start a new life in safety and dignity. As part of our humanitarian programs, we are offering much needed assistance to those who have been displaced, both within their own countries and across borders. In the Sahel and the Lake Chad region, for example, the EU is mobilizing 40 million euros in emergency humanitarian funding. With this funding, we are providing food, water, shelter, and basic health care. In parallel, we are also looking to tackle the overlapping causes of displacement. For example, when food insecurity and climate risks meet, we provide humanitarian food assistance, and in parallel, we strengthen our support to local sustainable and resilient food systems. We are also adapting our humanitarian response to the impact of climate change, striving to act before disasters strike. We are progressively mainstreaming preparedness and anticipated action throughout our EU-funded humanitarian operations. This year, we are chairing the Platform on Disaster Displacement, which will allow us to strengthen global coordination and action in areas where we need to act together. But we know that much more needs to be done by all of us. On this, allow me to share three points. First, we need to do more to close humanitarian funding gap. 64% of the world's humanitarian needs are unmet. For too long, we have been relying on a very small number of donors to provide the bulk of displacement, food, and climate-related aid. This is not sustainable. We need to widen the donor base. Together with its member states, the European Union is inviting donors to increase their humanitarian aid budgets. This year, to date, almost 10 billion has been raised through dedicated pledging events, including for Sahel, Horn of Africa, Syria, and others. All of this is helping to support the world's most vulnerable communities, including displaced individuals and internally displaced persons. Second, we must continue our work on protection and international humanitarian law. Too many displaced people still remain without access to aid. The international community also needs to protect all displaced people, especially those individuals at risk of unsafe returns. And third, we must work on building resilience at local level. By strengthening cooperation between humanitarian and development actors, the nexus, we can support resilience and help countries withstand shocks and ultimately break the cycle of disasters, destruction, displacement, and the debt. 
To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is determined to support every effort to tackle the overlapping crisis facing our world and to ensure displaced people get the assistance they need wherever they may find themselves. But we can only do this by working together. And this is why I really thank again to the IOM for organizing this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lenertic. Our next speaker, actually, in our next video statement uh, is coming from the designated Egyptian presi president for the COP27, uh, His Excellency Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, Mr. Semak Shoukri. Mr. Antonio Vettorino, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Excellencies, distinguished participants. It gives me great pleasure to participate in the second session of the International Dialogue on Migration that addresses one of the most pressing challenges the world is facing today, namely the nexus between climate change and mobility. Climate migration became a reality that has been increasingly recognized as a key global policy issue which requires coherent and long-term solutions. Frequent and destructive disasters result in the displacement and forced migration of millions of people globally every year. In parallel, slow onset environmental degradation of ecosystems and loss and the implications of human-induced environmental changes can trigger displacement and undermine livelihoods and exasperate tensions in many parts of the world. The impacts of environmental degradation and climate change on migratory movements are felt in all regions of the world. Yet it is important to acknowledge the differentiated impacts depending on contextual factors such as economic, social, political, environmental, and personal circumstances. Statistics also show that displacement caused by disasters worldwide is more than double that caused by conflicts. With this bleak situation in mind, we cannot afford to be bystanders. Major and urgent political efforts to mitigate climate change are critical to avert the most devastating consequences of this crisis on people and their environment. There is a need for a holistic, inclusive, and collaborative approach at national, regional, and global level with a view to promoting a more climate-resilient and migrant-inclusive society and economy. In my capacity as the COP27 President-designate, we will seek to focus on enhancing implementation in order to set up rigorous and focused climate actions in cooperation with all relevant stakeholders. We need to ensure greater synergies between the Global Compact for Migration, the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to scale up action on climate change and migration, which places primarily emphasis on the well-being and rights of all humans without discrimination, enhance regular pathways for safe, orderly, and regular migration through fair recruitment that respects human dignity, as well as ensuring that migration remains a choice, not a necessity. Funding gaps must be addressed to help mobilize the necessary resources for disaster risk reduction, climate change mitigation, and adaptation early warning systems and long-term development programs. There is also a need to discuss predictable finance aligned with global climate commitments and the principles of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities to respond to current and future mobility scenarios in the context of the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation. Moreover, Climate and environmental migration is a multi-causal phenomenon that requires comprehensive responses from different policy areas. Therefore, adopting a holistic governmental 
and societal approach is key to ensure that no one is left behind. Last but not least, we need a paradigm shift on humanitarian programming and funding for climate-induced mobility, given the protracted nature of such crises. Short-term solutions aren't effective or economically sound. Response should adapt to tackle the compounding challenge and bolster resilience. More emphasis should be placed on developmental peace nexus to ensure sustainability and coherence in international efforts and prioritization in disaster preparedness. Excellencies, distinguished participants, before I conclude, I would like to highlight three issues that the COP27 presidency elevated to the top of climate change agenda as they are essential to protecting livelihoods and preventing displacement whilst ensuring a green transition for our world. First, water security. Unpredictability of water cycles caused by severe problems such as water stress, displacement, and conflict over resources, with a continued lack of adaptation capacity, resilience, financial means, and foresight planning, and international and regional cooperation, Adaptation in the water sector becomes critical to how successful we address the effects of climate change. The Action for Water Adaptation and Resilience Initiative represents a call to address water as key to climate change adaptation and resilience. Second, food security. Agri-food systems are increasingly impacted by climate change. However, improving these systems offers a unique opportunity to address climate change by building resilience across these systems while reducing emissions. The Food and Agriculture for Sustainable Transformation Initiative aims to be an accelerator to transform agri-food systems, drive effective actions, and avoid duplications. Third, Climate Response for Sustaining Peace Initiative focuses on the climate displacement, peace nexus, and aim at discussing innovative ideas to advance durable solutions and accelerate climate finance for sustaining peace. The initiative will be implemented through activities on the policy, knowledge, and operational fronts to strengthen resilience and address existing gaps. I believe that the COP27 meetings that will start in a few days in Sharm el-Sheikh will provide a timely opportunity to reflect on how to shape response to the related challenges. Because we cannot continue to do business as usual, since failure to act in a coordinated and preventive manner to mitigate and adapt to the adverse effects of climate change and to address displacement and its root causes could undermine peace, stability, and prosperity in countries of origin and destination alike. I thank you. Our last speaker on our opening session is here with us in person. This is Mr. Abdirahman Abdi Shakur, Special Presidential Member for Drought Response in Somalia. Honorable Abdi, Abirakam Abdi Shakur was appointed as the Federal Government of Somalia Special Presidential Member for Drought Response by the President of Somalia in May 2022. He was Chief Negotiator for the Alliance for the Real Rebellion of Somalia at Djibouti Conference, which led to the formation of the Transnational Federal Government of Somalia. When the first post-transnational government was set up back in 2012, he was appointed to the Senior Policy Advisor to the President and in 2014, the Special Envoy, just the United Nations Assistant Mission in Somalia as a Special Advisor to the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Somalia. Mr. Abdi, Abdi Rahman, please, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, this IDM will be timely in the lead up to the 27th conference 
of the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change COP27, taking place in Egypt, and building on the successful outcomes of the first Inter International Migration Review Forum to strengthen action to address complex interlinks between climate change, food security, and human mobility. I thank IOM for organizing this conference and inviting me to this crucial dialogue. Food insecurity is a global growing, is a growing global challenge and it's becoming greater cause to displacement and migration. With only eight years left to achieve the sustainable development goal of zero hunger, one in 10 people do not have enough to eat. Buffered growing population, disease, diseases, conflict, climate change, and change to the global economies and geopolitics are playing key role in the global food emergency. According to the IBCC, climate crisis could lead a extra 183 million people facing hunger by 2050. Dear colleagues, hunger could become next pandemic. A warming planet affects show how food is growing and distributed. A number of climate change related disasters like extreme heat, drought and flood has doubled since early 1990s. Harvest has been shrinking and crops ravaged by the bests like enormous locusts that devastated the north of Africa and in particular my country, Somalia. Drought caused harvest to fall, repeatedly bringing nation's crop production down to 70% and the death of more than 3 million livestock. A climate change intensifies the temperature rises. Food crisis will become the norm rather than the exception. Ukraine crisis has shown how disruption to the critical food production regions can have severe knock-on effort across the globe, felt mostly keenly by the developing and poorer countries as well. According to the World Bank, global food prices are on track to rise 23% this year, having already risen 31% in 2021. Climate change is also making food less nutritious. The oceans are affected too. As water gets warmer, it is forcing fish that prefer uh, certain temperatures to move to new areas. Today, around half of Somali's population are food insecure. More than 1 million people have displaced by the drought, which is worst in 40 years. Half of a million children are facing acute malnutrition. The country is on the brink of the famine. Every cycle of drought and famine creates another mass displacement and new IDBs. As, and as such, it will significantly contribute to the inter international migration in the Horn of Africa and to the Gulf regions. Food insecurity is not only a driver of migration, migration, but it's also the threat to the Somali's peace and stability by leading to increased intercommunal violence, rise, rise in, child, in child marriages, gender-based violence, and youth vulnerability to the recruitment by the extremist group. Over the past months, I have been traveling to different capitalists in North America and Europe to seek a strengthening partnership with the government and Somali diaspora, hoping to urgently prevent famine and mitigate a growing catastrophe before hundreds of thousands of people die. And Somalia's hard won political and security achievement will be revised by this crisis and before our full potential has been realized. I thank our partners to their ongoing support. But the situation in my country demands meaningful investments in infrastructure, technology, and renewable energy. 
food and green energy production, sustainable farming, fishing, forestry, and water management practices, which is a key to building resilience in our communities in order to adapt and mitigate the effect of the climate change. I must say that our government cannot do alone. We need to support and voice from all our partners, friends, and donors. At the regional level, Somalia was one of the countries to endorse the Kampala Ministerial Declaration on Migration, Environment, and Climate Change, which outlines East Africa's combined ambition to prioritize, respond, to a galvanized global support for taking climate change induced migration and displacement. Climate change is not going to stop anytime soon, nor is migration. We need to diversify food production, agro diets, supply chains, and markets, and address the indebtedness, economic inequalities, and market distortions to have contributed that have contributed to the current crisis. We need a coordinated effort across all sectors to rethink and repair our food system, making them more equitable, more resilient, and more responsive in times of great need. We need destination countries to acknowledge that their labor markets do in fact need people by bringing them out of the shadows into the safety and regular immigration status. Happening for the first time in Africa next COP27 is a key opportunity to gain support from the international community to break cycle Somalia is out of this ongoing cycle of crisis. In Somalia, and I'm sure this is the case for many other countries, we need access to climate justice fund to help us make the urgent change need to protect our communities. Ultimately, we need global leaders to jump beyond climate action to reduce the shocks that we are already feeling. We need polluting countries to cut their emissions so that, so that the goal of the Paris Agreement can be achieved. Helping vulnerable families cope with the climate change will bring us closer to the ending hunger in Somalia and other countries of the continent. To our country becoming a contributor to the food security and sustainable energy production and ensuring that stability, life, and livelihood opportunities are available for our younger people at home. Finally, I thank IOM for not only hosting us and bringing us together in this forum, but also as a reliable partner for Somali government and particularly for my office. I thank you very much. So thank, thank you, our last speaker in opening session. And now I would like to give the possibility to those that are still with us to give a final uh, thought and final message for us to work on in the next uh, two days. We still have EU Commissioner Leonard Shish online, and I would like to give him the floors first to give us the message around which we should focus a little bit more the next two days. Mr. Leonard Shish, please. Him still online? Not be online anymore. Okay, then I would like now to come back to uh, Mr. Abe Mahman for the final message to us. Uh, I, I thank you again for uh, having uh, and bringing us together for uh, this critical dialogue. Uh, it seems to me that, um, as I outlined my speech and uh, my, uh, my remarks, that food insecurity is impacted uh, by the uh, global, other global challenges. Um, and if 2020 was the year of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, our concern and fear is that maybe 2022 or 23 is becoming the pandemic of, of the food crisis. 
So I, I think we, we really need have to have a dialogue, and critical dialogue, on how can we address this issue before it comes to a pandemic. And, and, and we felt uh, the food, uh, importance of food security uh, out of the uh, coronavirus, and as well as the green crisis has shown us that how the world is interlinked and, 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 and it impacts to, to each other, and, and it can have impacts. Even the uh, developed countries, they also felt as our poorer countries, how the food security are very important, and, and we need to invest and, 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 and in that. Also, as uh, uh, coming from Somalia, where uh, four consecutive rainy season has failed because of the climate change, and the entire Horn of Africa are facing that drought and an and extreme and heat uh, that only can be dealt with not uh, short-term humanitarian assistance, but we need to be addressed the root cause of this crisis, which is a climate change. Unless we uh, have the opportunity for our communities to have uh, build their resilience in order to adapt the extreme weather and, and, and mitigate the fallout of the climate change, we will continue facing that uh, food insecurity and humanitarian and crisis. So I'm, I'm, I'm calling again that we need to invest uh, and, 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 and building the resilience and, and building and, and mitigating the climate fallout. And that can ha can, cannot happen and cannot be done by the uh, countries that are affected by the climate change unless we get uh, and have access to the climate uh, justice uh, finance and have access to the uh, and funding that's been, been allocated for, to address the climate impact. And I, I call again, uh, we have to uh, stand before and, and, and unite our effort to uh, bring that uh, critical issues on, on the coming and COP27 uh, in Cairo. I thank you again. Thank you, sir. And I would like to give the floor to Antonio Vitrino, Director General of IOM. Mr. Vitrino, please. Thank you so much. I will start by thanking all the panelists. I think that uh, in order to set the scene, we had a very broad spectrum of uh, testimonies about uh, the challenges that we are confronted with. Uh, the issue of food security is a, a critical issue today and it will be an even more critical issue tomorrow. In my take, uh, today we are above all confronted with the problem of distribution and rising of prices. Unfortunately, due to the conflict uh, in Europe and due to the impacts of climate change, a little bit everywhere in the world, next year we will head to the problem of distribution a significant problem of production, of being able that uh, the agro-production worldwide is capable to meet the needs of the people all over the world. And therefore, I think that one of the focus on uh, food production and food distribution is uh, critical to guarantee that uh, we are capable to cope with uh, the humanitarian catastrophes that we are witnessing, be it because of conflict, because of floods, because of drought, uh, of uh, uh, slow onset environmental uh, degradation. My second point is about uh, the need to give visibility and raise awareness for the urgent need of adaptation, mitigation, and uh, disaster risk uh, uh, reduction. In fact, uh, those actions require support, transfer of technology, and investment. And our firm belief is that if we do not do it now, it will be much more costly in the future. In terms of human lives, in terms of humanitarian crisis, in terms of social uproar. So the priority for COP27 is to call the attention of the international community for the urgent need of focusing on adequate uh, human capital, technological transfer and financial support for adaptation, mitigation, risk reduction, and building the resilience of the communities. Because the communities that are more impacted by climate change do not want to move. They want to go on living on the places where they live. But when they are forced to move, they do it 
against their will. And uh, for the time being, the forced displacement because of climate change is above all internal displacement. We are witnessing a large number of internally displaced people. Some of them will be able to return back to the regions of origin. Others will not be able to return to the, to the regions of origin. But for both of them, those who return and those who are not able to return, we need to find durable solutions. And the challenge is what kind of hope and perspectives for the future can we give to the people that are forcibly displaced because of, uh, climate, uh, because of climate change. And at the end of the day, migration is only one part of the narrative. But in some cases, if people are internally displaced, if they don't find durable solutions, they will go on moving. They will go on moving. And sooner or later, they will cross an international border and they will become international migrants. IOM is very much focused on monitoring these situations, on identifying uh, uh, the places where the risk is higher and trying to mobilize the international support to uh, the governments and the local authorities and the civil societies to cope with the challenges of climate change. So we look very much forward to your insights during these, the, your debates during three days, during these two days to help us preparing for COP27 and for our programmatic action in the future. Thank you so much for, uh, to the panelists again, and uh, here I conclude my opening remarks. Thank you. I'd like to thank you to Director General and all uh, opening speakers for setting the scene. Now we'll just quickly change our scene for the panel one, and we are starting with the panel one of our work. Just a small technical note. Uh, for those that would like to speak and actually would like to intervene after the panel one will be possible. After the opening session was not foreseen. Therefore, whoever asked for the floor after the opening session will be given the floor after the panel one. Thank you.